Okay. I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, We have a number of topics this evening, uh, three to be exact, if you you peep the socials. The first of which I think is near and dear to Reese's heart, uh, something that I was not privy to, but... I, I was alerted by my colleague here to the student protests that happened for college in response yeah. to the death of Walter Wallace Jr. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I was just reading up on it to get acclimated to what was going on. So I, I'm curious to hear your insights about basically what, what has been happening and, and what your yeah. take on it is. Yeah. So well, let, let's, let's just start with the Walter Wallace shooting. You know, we, we, we had an episode... We're like, I got choked up because I'm like, it sucks to be fucking black right now. Like, mm-hmm. there's nothing awesome about being fucking black right now. Um, not that I think that there was ever some like salubrious golden age of blackness in this country, but like, this has not been it. Um, and I found myself, you know, I follow Mark Lamont Hill, obviously, you know, uh, an interesting public intellectual. He's got a lot of really cool things to say. He's written a lot of really cool things, teaches at the temple, blah, blah, blah. And I'm scrolling through, scrolling through, you know, like just mindlessly thumb running my phone. And I, I come across, you know, Mark's page. I watched the shooting and I kept scrolling. Mm. I've become so desensitized to this. As a black person, as a race scholar. And it took Herbie like four heartbeats to be like, what the and for me to like go back and to rewatch it not like to to just like reprocess that moment Mm -hmm. and you know when i i teach black studies and when i brought it to the table like it's not that my kids didn't care it's that they were just sort of like so beaten by the year that we've had that I think it just doesn't it just doesn't register. It just doesn't register. Um, and I've had to do a lot of soul searching about that moment and like what I need to do to like recuperate my own affective faculties. Mm-hmm. Um, now, obviously, you know, Haverford's a, a, an institution that's near and dear to my heart. It's a Quaker institution or a historically Quaker institution. Both my kids go there, um, and so. You know, I'm plugged into like what's happening there. And my kids are like, you know, and my godsons, as you know, they're like super independent kids, right? Like they're the sorts of young people who do their own thing and run their own schedules and run their own lives. And they hit me up when they need me. And obviously, you know, to catch up, they're good kids. Um, but the, they're not like a, let's call our godfather every weekend. You know, like that's just not who they are. Yeah. And so when, when Eli FaceTimes me, I'm like, huh. You know, and it's it's like when you call. You know what I'm saying? Like like you don't call me to bullshit. It, if you call me on the phone, I know it's it's important, it's necessary, and I pick up. So I pick up the phone. He's like, "Teacher Reese, you're not gonna believe what's going on." So, you know, Haverford is in Haverford. Um, you know, super close to Philadelphia, and and the shooting was was super impactful and and for for young people at Haverford who of course had their own like at Haverford page who who've been processing some of the work that's happening that's that's necessary for their campus to 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 be more earnestly anti-racist this was a huge blow and i think part of it had to do with with the proximity um to philadelphia um and of course you know the the proximity to philadelphia and and the juxtaposition of privilege between Haverford and and West Philly, um, and they they received an email from as I understand it right I'm I'm not a faculty member at Haverford I don't represent Haverford outside of my godchildren going there, um, as I understand it the uh, the president of the college issued an email that was like super cautionary um, that 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 heeded precaution and 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 warned against you know. Uh, headstrong emotional responses and this was you know in a moment where we're where we're meant to value impact over intent i do i like as a as a president of a college in the midst of covid with with all of the financial vulnerabilities that that's brought in and all of the public health vulnerabilities that that's brought in 
I, I, can, I can sympathize with the move to send the email. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I'm just like, how the fuck did you think this was going to go? Like, and so, so long story short, students have gone on strike. A, 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 an enormous cohort of students on campus, uh, uh, mostly students of color, have gone on strike. Um, students who are workers have ceased to work. Um, students have ceased going to class, have ceased turning in work. Um, they've ceased going to dining facilities. Hmm. So Eli's like cooking his own meals. They're starting like a mutual fund to make sure that folks are getting fed. Um, and so the, the document that I shared with you, um, you know, is, is, a, is a statement and, and, and a list of, of demands. And what's interesting about this statement is that, that clearly like for, for students at Haverford, there's there's this confluence of the shooting death of Walter Wallace in Philadelphia and the 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 looming unresolved anti-blackness that was that 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 came to the fore on the heels of an earlier wave of black mobilizing this summer and their own black at page so the, it's i mean it just becomes this perfect storm and so while I think you could read this document as disjointed, right, as, as making these, com- not competing claims, but claims about the shooting and claims about the police and claims about Haverford in a way that feels incoherent, I think what, what, what these students are threshing out is actually that confluence of, of, of what's happening at Haverford and what's happening in Philadelphia. Um, You know, I'll, I'll read a paragraph here um, to, to sort of so that our audience can kind of capture a little bit of, of, of kind of where some of these students are at. Um, and this is in response, uh, again, to Wendy Raymond, President Powerford's letter. Um, and so the, the, the co-authors of this statement write, the statements protesting will not bring Walter Wallace back and now is not the time are unsympathetic, counterproductive, and insensitive. For someone who claims to be dedicated to anti-racism and social justice, these unexamined assertions actively harm the black community, not just on Haverford's campus, but in all of our communities. In choosing to not actively support, um, and they list a couple of things, students who want to protest Walter Wallace, for Walter Wallace Jr., Breonna Taylor, and all of the other black lives taken by police officers, you are not only silencing our voices and preventing us from protesting the violence enacted on black people, but actively stopping us from reinforcing the dignity and humanity of black lives by showing up for community members down the street. By doing so, you are actively trying to suppress our anger. Furthermore, in your email, you offered us a vigil in community worship space as an alternative to protesting. When we only participate in the recognition of black lives after death, we end up perpetuating the death of blackness itself. Instead, we should be celebrating, upholding, protecting, and defending black lives too. So now we ask you, if now is not the time, when will be the time for black lives to matter? That is a powerful statement for students to be making, especially to the heads of their institution. Um, and it, you know, I was reading the reporting that was being done by the campus newspaper, which I, I believe is student run. Um, and, you know, they, they made some, some very interesting points in this letter and in their addressing of the president and the dean, right, to acknowledge that protesting is not the problem that needs to be addressed by their administration, right? They don't need the higher ups telling them like protesting is dangerous and you're putting yourself in harm's way, right? Acknowledging that, that they themselves understand the risk of engaging in this practice and, and also acknowledge that it's a responsibility that they must engage in it. Mm-hmm. Noting that it is an important thing to do, not just in mourning, but in active protest. And it made me wonder, and this this is a question that I think they asked themselves. Um, it may be in here. Um, I don't know for sure, but it was it was certainly written in the article. It may have been another statement made by a student, but it was a question of asking whether or not Haverford was committed to anti racist action, or if it was all just a you know a big show. And this alludes to our our topic last week, 
right, about digital activism in particular, yeah. and whether or not a lot of yeah. it is just putting on airs. But you could literally insert any institution into that question. You could take Habit First Game out and put in right. any school right. anywhere and mm-hmm. ask the question, are you actually committed to anti-racist action? Or are you just doing a little song and dance mm-hmm. to appease certain entities, whomever they may be? Right. Something I've, I've had to ask, even of my own work as a moderator of an anti-black racism course, right? Trying to help grad students, faculty, and staff navigate curriculum that was voluntarily curated Mm -hmm. to teach about the history, the ideology, and to impart a sense of critical analysis and understanding onto people who may not be well-versed about why there is a structure of anti-black racism in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And this may be me reading way too deep into what, what, what sorts of correspondence I get, but every time someone rightfully is 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 you know behind in their work with the course because they've got other stuff going on we all have other stuff going on that that is not knocking people's you know time management skills or their decision to to prioritize certain tasks right but i wonder right like if if it doesn't also sort of sound a lot like i i can put this off right like asking like how long is this stuff going to be around so that maybe one day i'll get to teaching myself about anti-black racism. Right. Right. Like I enrolled so that people knew that I was part of it and my name is on it and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be recognized as having taken part, but the commitment doesn't feel there. You know, it feels mm-hmm. a little empty and hollow. And it reminds me of a lot of the same question that these students are, are raising. I feel like most institutions are, are engaging in that same practice that even with some administration and faculty at these places who are genuinely committed to this, that the overarching structure of the school doesn't allow for them to actually really commit to any of this stuff. Even with the smaller campuses, I feel like it's infinitely harder with a larger campus. Um, but at a liberal arts college, theoretically, if your administration is, is committed to what they claim to be committed to, they should be capable of, of engaging in activism in the same way that their students want to, right. but they don't choose to. So, I, like, one of the questions I have, I guess, with protesting, because reading about, like, how the students were met by police blockade and stuff when they were when they were marching through the streets um, after they left the campus, is what responsibility does the institution have to those students who feel like they are perfectly reasonable in taking responsibility for their own lives, right? Mm-hmm. And saying, like, you know, like, c'est la vie, like this has to get done no matter what happens. Like, like where where does the institution's responsibility come into play? Like, do they just absolve themselves of yeah. of any sort of relationship to these movements and say like, well, you're making a choice, and we already told you that we don't think this is the right choice. So if anything should happen, like, are we just washed hands? I don't know. Like, where where do they get where do, where should they be in that conversation? Knowing that their students are saying like, yo, we're willing to literally go out there and take whatever sort of right. ire comes with being out there. This isn't to say that everything comes back to destiny, but it's to me, it's a fire break calculus. Where can I take space and fight until I die so that I achieve the most good? To me, that is like, like, and, and of course, it's meant to sound romantic, fucking destiny, and we're talking about titans and destiny. But the, like, so I, I, I offer that to say this. I think that as a student, that's the choice, right? Like, what is my body worth? What am I willing to, to be? You, never mind. What? It's, I know, I know, okay. I know the reference. Yeah, yeah okay. no, I consciously made that reference. <laughs> okay, um, it's a good, it's a good Seosin song. For those um, of you who are unaware, listen to more Seosin. Everyone should listen to more Seosin. Um, what is my body worth? What is my body worth? Right, like what, what is so important to me, to society, to a greater good that I'm willing to be beaten by police, that I'm willing mm-hmm. to be arrested that I'm willing to be disappeared by federal agents in order to advance those lines. 
Um, and so, to me, like, now that, right, like, that question that, that protesters and activists and people who are, like, willing to fight cops and stuff, like, make, that, que that, that negotiation that they have to engage in, colleges are not doing that, right? Ne like, the, the, we've seen the neoliberalization of the university. That's not, like, we're not in the middle of it. It's accomplished. Like, that's, that it, we are in it already. And I think that that, that neoliberal orientation that colleges and universities have is at odds with the robust pursuit of an anti-racism that makes places like Haverford accountable to the communities that they reside in. Because I think that's part of what the students are trying to articulate is like, they, like we're not in Philly proper, but we are mm -hmm. an institution of this city. And, and we owe this to our neighbors. These people are our neighbors and we have to show up. And we also have black students here and we owe it to them to show up and to insist and to push. And you know, this piece about like black lives shouldn't matter after the fact, that we have to do the things now while people are alive to make sure that they stay that way. Um, you know, so like the, the, the question becomes, I think the question that students should be posing is like, is Haverford willing to contribute to a bail fund for their own kids? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, like what, what, what is Haverford willing to do for those students who take to school or who take to the front lines of these protests because they want to make Philly a better place to be black. Um, and I don't, I, I can't imagine that Haverford's having that conversation. I can't imagine mm -hmm. that, that administrators at Haverford are, are having that conversation. Now, one of the things that's interesting that I find interesting, um, and this is to be a little bit more critical of, of the students, um, is it's interesting that in a moment where they're lambasting the school for not, acquiescing isn't the right term, because like nobody's gonna put a gun to your head and keep you from leaving campus, right? Like, mm -hmm. But in, in, in the school expressing officially reservation about protesting, it's interesting that students have now oriented themselves not towards Walter Wallace, but towards Haverford, right? So the object of protest now becomes Haverford. Yeah. And I, I gotta be honest, that's the safer path, right? And, and, and I say this, of course, fully acknowledging that I'm just now playing catch up on these documents, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not privy to the finer pieces of what students are organizing, so I could be totally missing critical pieces here. But if you're, like, if you're striking at Haverford from the comforts of a Haverford dormitory and not going to Philly, you're full of shit. Because, yeah, okay, it, I see what you're saying. That's cozy. Mm -hmm. That's 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 comfortable, right? And and I've been having in in a number of ways. You know, my my kids here at West Town have been having this conversation about like, you know, like there there there's some folks who looked who who looked at at black app pages, ours included, and said, "Wow, what a what a privilege it is to." to talk about microaggressions in a time where we're protesting killings um, mm -hmm. from, the, from the vantage point of like elite, private, exclusive institutions, right? What a privilege it is to have the highest stakes be your academic standing when there are communities devoid of resources who are protesting staying alive. We're protesting their right to not be shot and killed in the street, mm -hmm. right? Now, I'm I'm not right. I'm I'm not saying that that that's in fact where Haverford students are, right? I I'm I'm not an insider to this. I'm coming to to much of this nascently, recently, and certainly from the from the outside. But if you are taking umbrage with Haverford administrators or their express reservation about protesting, and you are choosing to just strike at Haverford 
by not going to class and not submitting work, but then not going into Philly to fight for Philly, to fight for black Philadelphians, you and I don't have, don't, we don't share the same politics. Mm-hmm. I wonder how much of that is is rooted in in a I don't know like a fear of of retribution if that's maybe the right phrasing for for that situation right um that that it's not just going to come from the institution but it's going to come from from other students as well right like but th- that it's it's such a small community that if if you're the one that's 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 absent even like the one time to say like I went I tried to do the thing and it, I don't know. It gets sort of to it gets turned on you in a way where it's like, well, I, I don't I don't know I don't know that I'm I'm thinking through this the right way. No, I I, I I think that piece about like retribution is interesting, right? Like, what are the social consequences for protesting, right? Eli sent me an article, not an article, but I think it was like an op-ed that was I don't know if it was printed already or was circulated of a student in poli sci, and I feel like it's always somebody in poli sci. Mm-hmm. expressing disagreement with the protests. And I guess, like, there, there are, uh, of course, uh, you know, other parties at Haverford who are not happy that students are are, are striking and, and want to see some return to normalcy, whatever that fucking looks like in the time of COVID. Right. Um, but if if you are so immobilized by the fear of social consequence at your cushy private school that you're then not moved to the streets of Philadelphia, you were never really about that life in the first place. Mm-hmm. That, that's just how I see it. That's just how it, and, and again, right, I, I like, I've met a lot of amazing young people at Haverford. Um, and I think my kids are <laughs> amazing young people. And I am not privy to the internal politics of the movement. But I, I, I gotta say like, the, if, if all of this returns Haverford students to Haverford, as opposed to having a, a dynamic, mobile political hinge that allows them to articulate the issues at Haverford in the context of broader Philadelphia, like if that's not the kind of nuance that you're willing to bring, I, I, d- I don't know what we're doing. Mm. I don't know what we're doing. Um, and, you know, and, and this moves me to like, th- like think about like some of their demands, right? I mean, it's an eight-page document. You know, I mean, the first demand, right? And this, and this is what's interesting. Like, the first demand is the removal of the president as chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. Um, but then there are moves here afoot as well to, like, address the relationship between police violence and its, and its collateral impact on campus. So, there, like, there is some nuance afoot, um, at least in how they're articulating the relationship between these two issues. But... You know, I, 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 I worry, you know, we're, we're very quick to, I'll, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve that comment. Mm. I'll reserve the comment that I was cooking because I, I really don't know enough. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I guess the reason, I, one of the reasons that I, I bring up this issue of retribution is because I was reading this op-ed um, or, you know, article from the, from the, the Haverford paper and mm-hmm. it, they had to write an editor's note at the top because apparently students who were implicated in the initial reporting were being doxxed. Now, far be it for me to assume that the institution isn't the one doing the doxing. I would, mm-hmm. I would assume that they don't really need to be spending resources like that, um, which leads me to believe that there are other students on campus, like the ones that you said that you've heard about that are expressing animosity and, and ill will towards those who who would seek to protest in any capacity it feels like they're dealing with a microcosm of greater activism which may be part of the reason that they're not stepping outside of the bounds of the college mm-hmm. but i think you're right to say that the unwillingness to do so is certainly problematic but there, right. there clearly is also something else, at least a, a little bit nefarious at play within the student body that suggests that there are those oh, sure. who are actively trying to disenfranchise 
the most activist students among the population. Right. And this this second yeah. demand here about um, you know following the footsteps of of you know one of their affiliate institutions and canceling class on yeah. election day actually um, reminds me of of an issue that I have. We got an email today, my institution saying that all scheduling for the rest of the week should proceed as normal. That no faculty, no staff, and no one should make any adjustments or addendums to their schedule based yeah. on election results. Classes should be normal tomorrow. Classes should be normal Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. All curriculum and testing and scheduling should stay the same. Yep. And Fuck admittedly, it, it, it feels a little a little flat. It feels tone deaf in the same way that I think these students felt when they when they were told a lot of the same things. I'm like, that doesn't feel right. As if to say that anyone's going to be focused on anything else. And if you're not at least going to alter your curriculum or your teaching to account for what's going on, right? Then then as an institution you are being complicit in not necessarily anti anti blackness, but at least to some extent you are because that whether we want to talk about it or not, it is an issue that is salient in this election. And I think it's even before that. I think it's even before we get to like identitarian issues that are definitely central to this election. It, for me, it's just, it's fundamentally like anti-intellectual to pretend like this election is fucking normal. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing about this is normal. Nothing about this is normal, and I, you know, and I brought this up. Um, I brought this up in in a number of places at work, and it was, you know, it was productive, and and the comment was well received, you know. But we're, I mean, I, I work at a pretty like pretty liberal place. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ben, me who has multiple desks scheduled on Thursday. Hey, I, I didn't do that. Um, Oh, wow, I just realized that like our viewership just like blew up. Um, you know, like and I, and I think you know, if I've got students in the chat other than Ben, I think that they would attest to the fact that when I'm interjecting my own politics, I strive, I don't always get it right, but I strive to name that, right? Like this is me speaking mm -hmm. from my own subject position opening up a window to you about where I stand on these issues. And I make it clear to students too that like I don't I don't grade you on on whether or not you agree with me. In fact, some of like the richest papers for me to read are from students with whom I have like deep political like division with mm. because it's interesting to see that, to read their ta to to read their points and then my feedback is as much about like grammar and mechanics and structure and what have you as much as it is not rebuttals, but like things that I want them to think about or things that they've given me to think about. Um, but at some point, particularly those of us who work in education, like it, the Trump regime is empirically dangerous, right? Like, like yeah. the, 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 <laughs> the the data is overwhelming. The science is overwhelming. Like the patterns are overwhelming. And so it becomes, I think, an abdication of like universities as public responsibility to not condemn the bullshit. Like if you if universities are meant to serve a public good, and I know that like under these neoliberal regimes they, they don't. We have to say, no, this is dangerous. This is dangerous. We, we, we cheapen that responsibility by saying that civility requires silence. Civility requires that we create inroads and, and space for authoritarianism, fascism, racism, homophobia, misogyny. No thanks. Fuck that. And this is an issue that we've raised before, right? Something that, that I still struggle with. And even preparing for tomorrow... Um, I've been asked a couple times. Actually, I was even called by my mother and explicitly Mom. told, mijo, cuídate. 
Why? Because she's concerned about things that I say. And I, I try to do the same that you do, right? I try to, to qualify all my statements by pointing out this is where my allegiances lie. I am by no means trying to enlist you in my service. However, when presented with incontrovertible evidence, I'm not going to pretend it doesn't exist. You are, act, like, you are actively asking me to resist explaining fact. Yep. Whether or not you agree with it is on you, but when the evidence is clear, I feel duty bound to explain it. It's why I altered my syllabus and rearranged the schedule, mm -hmm. right? To account for the things that are, are cropping up. You know, right now my students and I are talking about the economy. Wednesday we're going to be talking all about one of, you know, the current administration's biggest talking points about the boom of the economy. And I'm, I'm trying to set up an explanation of like, this is all a fallacy. Mm -hmm. We are quite literally suffering economically, whether anybody wants to admit it or not. Um, and it's hard to to have your institution tell you you have to resist the urge to adapt to the situation and do what is objectively best for your students because yeah. that's not actually the objective that we're trying to seek. We're actually trying to be as uncritical as possible, right? No pushing of the agenda, no, no questioning of the status quo, just letting it be what it is and hoping that young adults are going to figure it out on their own, right? For me, it feels infinitely more critical. And again, this is an issue that I've raised before, right? Because I have students of voting age. It gets hard, and it's why I had to make adjustments because I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at them and the questions they ask me, and I say, well, holy shit, if I don't actually address these things with you, I have done a terrible disservice to everyone by under-preparing you to participate in an election. And then to, to hear that, that the school is saying, well, you know, should anything to go one way or the other, like just proceed business as usual. I'm like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. How? There's not a chance in hell. I can't. I don't even think that the, the structure of, of this, this academic field allows for me to not pay attention. I think I would get my ASA membership revoked if I was like, you know what? The election doesn't exist. Nah, bro. I don't know. ASA <laughs> thinks they're radical. Well, they okay. That's a, we won't talk about them. That's a whole other problem. I'm just um, saying. Um, but I think like, I think that there is a distinction between telling a student what to think, and evaluating them on, on their beliefs. Right, and that to me I is very I, distinct from telling students. But they push how back on that a lot. Think they push back on that a lot. Is something that who's I the, that I've the, the students at least. Not all, but some. I've I've had I've had a, a number of students who and Reese are being asked if Weston has said the same thing about um about scheduling and and addressing the my election. views my um. views do not, oh <laughs> about well my views do not reflect those of my employer to be clear I'm not being coy um uh, so we like we're not changing our schedule insofar as we're not taking days off but like employees are allowed to make modifications to their schedule so they can vote if that means having to do asynchronous stuff or whatever like we've been given the the bandwidth um the asa is always watching um i have a lot of cuss words that should follow that but i'll leave it there because they are in fact always um and so we, we've been giving a lot given a lot of latitude in how we approach tomorrow as voters we've also been given a lot of latitude not a lot, but a, a, a fair deal of, of latitude in how we approach this as people, right? Like there, there are some of us for whom the next few days, weeks, months, however long this shit takes, are going to be really, really harrowing and, and, and tearing asunder and, and really heart-wrenching. Those are not my politics. I'm, that's not how I process these things. That's not how I process 2016. Um, I was, frankly, in... I was mad that people were mad, that people were sad. I'm like, y'all clearly don't understand basic statistics. The victory was within the margin of error. And what are we mourning? Like, we're, am I, I'm not mourning a Hillary loss. A third Clinton presidency? Please. 
please, the Clintons who've been retrograde on the issues that move me to the ballot box? No, I was not sad for Hillary. Um, but that's where people were. And I'm not about to sit there and tell people to like, shut the fuck up and stop crying. Um, and so we've been given a lot of latitude in how we process emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, et cetera. There've been resources made available to the adults. Um, we've been given, we've been looking to, to shepherd our students um, in, in thinking about a, a multitude of ways of how to support them. But I think this is a moving target, right? Like we don't know what the fuck's gonna happen next. So, I don't know. God, it's terrifying. Uh, it, it's I don't it's know. terrifying because it's it's okay. It's it's scary simply because of the I think the amount of legwork that's going to come mm. over the next like months, years of time. Yeah. Of like very similar to 2016, I think, of of explanation for those who who haven't been paying attention, who are a little like <laughs> unsavvy about about the the nuance of what's been going on, right? All those people who don't understand, you know, how and why our our checks and balance system is actually incredibly inefficient, right? Like explaining to them th this is what's been going on. It's been the longest con of your life, right? Like it, it's been it's been like a seventy year plan, not like a four year plan. You just haven't been watching long enough to see seeds planted and growing and manifesting over time, right? Like that work. Tires fed into the dumpster fire by the GOP, and this, right? Like I, I, the middle honestly, of the last century. Yeah, I, you know, this is gonna be really sacrilegious to say as a as a as a man who loves barbecue, but albeit if the GOP are not some of the world's greatest pitmasters when it comes to just roasting democracy. Right, oh, they have been life. slow cooking the shit out of this for so long. This is the greatest metaphor of all time because you know I'm right. It has been perfectly burning wood, pulling coals, and maintaining a, a constant temp of just a little bit of acrimony for everybody, but not too much, not too much smoke, <laughs> never too much smoke. And now they're just mm, yes, perfect temperature. We finally reached it, the pinnacle. They're ready. See, I, you know, I actually, I don't think that that's where they are. I don't think that that's where the GOP is. I think that there are, I think that the, tr I mean, we're seeing division, right, within the GOP. I think that there are some folks who think, okay, too much smoke, you know, the meat has turned acrid and are looking to Certainly sever some. their losses. You know, mm -hmm. I, I look at like the, the Lincoln Project, right? Like the idea that, that what the GOP needs to do is return to the values of Lincoln. Like that, that to me is actually like, like pretty provocative uh -huh. politically and, and interesting politically, given that it would invariably be a leftward swing relative to Trump. And so, but yeah, like, like your point though is, isn't, isn't that. It's that they've been feeding this fire for decades, feeding this fire for decades. Um, and I think, but I think that, that the, the fallout that I think lies on the horizon for the GOP is their fucking chickens coming home to roost. It's mm -hmm. the meat turning acrid. Um, and them realizing that, that the, the, the pegs upon which they've sought to, to sustain the coalition that they've built, the coalition that, that gave us Donald Trump, it's rotten. Right, and, and I, I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing that may manifest in the number of Senate seats that are in really tight races because they have hinged their entire campaign on the administration, whatever that the outcome may be. Right, they have basically just like meshed into whatever that that yeah. amorphous blob monster of of corrupted conservatism is. And are like, yeah, we're fine. We'll we'll go down with this ship, should that be what right. happens. But this is this is the hill we've prepared to die on because we we think that this is the right sort of 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 temp, if you will, to go back to the original metaphor. Um, yeah. Um, but so I'm what reading. I was saying, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um, so I, mean, I was saying earlier about getting students to to sort of like not not believe the hype, but to question their own beliefs when they push back on it. Oftentimes, it's because 
they've never been asked to think critically about the longevity of the process. For a lot of students, especially those that we're teaching, I think, I think anyone that, that, that I feel like anyone that predates us, college age and younger, yeah. it's hard to conceptualize of this as being a longstanding process. They just see it as a, it's been since 2016 thing. And so it's getting harder and harder for people, for young people to challenge the, the notion that this has been anything other than Trumpism. Right. Yeah. Right. Trying to get them to think outside that box and say, no, no you, need, you have to look farther back to what right. set up the possibility of this ever existing in the first place. That That's tough yeah. for a lot of them. And and some of them get defensive. Some of them say, you know, like, why are you challenging me on, on who I am and, and what I believe, what my family talks about? And I'm like, it's I'm not trying to, to belittle you or your family in any way, shape or form. That is, mm-hmm. that is not the point. The point is for you to look critically at what's going on. Right. And whether or not you change your mind is up to you. Mm-hmm. Right, we're not looking for converts, think, but we're, yeah. we're trying to, to get you to sort of like pop the pill and see the whole picture a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think you're, you're hitting on a couple things. I think, you know, I look at like my ninth graders now. They're, they're 14 now. They were in the fifth grade when Donald Trump came to the presidency. So their sense mm-hmm. of like what's normal in politics is a clown so fiesta. absolutely warped. What was that? It's a clown fiesta. It's an actual circus. Yeah. yeah. They just like they have no – and the, the number of times that they've asked, is this normal, is this normal? And I have to be like, oh, my God. Like they, they don't know. They really don't – like no, this isn't normal. It makes me wonder – has there yeah. ever ever has there ever been normalcy though? Like not not that normalcy is a, is anything other than a social contract that is completely dependent on, on whoever's yeah. you know constructing the defini- the definition of it. But like you think back to when we were kids, we yeah. we went through um, we went through the Monica Lewinsky trial. We went through the the murder of Princess Diana. Like there were weird things that happened during our childhoods, politically speaking. That for all intents and purposes now would be the same type of like high press coverage shenanigans that the kids now are used to. They would look at that stuff and be like, oh, sex scandal? Dope. Assassination? Ooh, intriguing. It's like law and order, Mm -hmm. but real. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas like for us, that's about as salacious as it got. Mm -hmm. So being that young and dealing with Trump and then coming to to your teenage years and be like, well, what is the, the alternative? Is there an alternative or is this just how politics operate? I feel like we've just seen it get progressively weirder. It curtails their imagination. And I think, yeah, I I think Hoagie's right. There's something about the, the social media that's created these like polarizing echo chambers of information. But the other piece too is I think that's precisely why we have, like an intellectual obligation to historicize this for mm-hmm. our students because this isn't normal. This isn't normal. And, and, and it only lands it as normal for them given the fucking cataclysms that they've lived through, right? Like the running joke now is like millennials are like the, the fucking John Connors of, of, um, of America because we've lived through two economic collapses. Upward mobility is like a laughable joke. And we are more willing to talk about killing ourselves than like starting lives because we are more likely to do one than the other. Mm -hmm. And so, but I think we owe it to our kids to say, this is not fucking normal. And there was something before this that while not perfect was not this dumpster. I mean, the idea that American democracy would genuflect before the ego of a reality TV star it, that was unfathomable. Less than a decade ago. And now we're talking about the bona fide death rattle of America. At, like, that's not normal. No. And, and I think we have to teach that to our kids. I think we owe that to them. And to pretend... That, that, that this is normal is precisely how we normalize this. Mm-hmm. And, and now, you also brought up an earlier point about, like, 
the the affective dimension, the, the emotional dimension of like to talk to to go to talk about like, hey, the Trump regime is awful. For some people, presses a lot of like emotional, familial buttons and commitments that moves them out of the like, I'm a student, this is a class, I'm intellectualizing these issues into like the emotional, defensive, lizard brainy side of things that then like atrophies how we speak and all sorts of shit um, and, and, and dialogue and any ability to like communicate. Um, and I think so, but that I think that has been so central to Trump's ascendancy. It's about how he makes a rightfully disaffected element of, of the American voting public feel. Mm -hmm. Right? The moment I knew that Hillary was going to shit the bed, not that she shot the bed, right? But, but I think the moment that I, that I really saw, like, he's going to win it was the deplorables speech. Where Hillary was like, you know, some, some I gather all of those Trump supporters and I put them in the basket of deplorable. Mm -mm. Mm. Within the context of this speech, if I recall correctly, and, and Chad, if you know better, feel free to, to, to redirect me, but I think she was alluding to the most extremist Trump acolytes, the disaffected, poor, white voters saw themselves in that statement. And so it wasn't about, for, for many, for many Trump voters, in 2016 at very least, it wasn't about race, it wasn't about disability, it wasn't about gender, it wasn't about sexual assault, it wasn't even about conservatism. It was about how they were made to feel. And, you know, uh, uh, Strangers in Their Own Land is entirely about that dimension of conservative thinking right now and, 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 conserv and conservative Americans. You know, I'm reading, I'm reading this. Uh, uh, so Chicago UP has this uh, series called Trios where they'll get three authors to like write this collection of essays on a particular topic. And I'm reading... Um, uh, the one on authoritarianism, and it's got Wendy Brown, who I, of course, love, Max Pensky, and, and Peter Gordon. And Brown, Brown gets first, first essay. Um, and she has this, you know, in one part of the essay, she has these, like, epigraphs of, uh, of, of various people talking about, like, this emergence of, like, authoritarianism, Th these emerging authoritarianisms all over the... Uh, all over the West. Um, and, and she quotes one person here who withheld their name. I introduced my 23-year-old law student daughter to Milo Yiannopoulos' videos. She says he makes her feel relieved and natural. Like mm -hmm. for some folks, it's not even about policy. Mm -hmm. It's about, it's about the how they're made to feel. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that can be so amorphous and so hard to pin down. And, and, and when we try and intellectualize it, we almost lose some of its dimensions. And therefore, like, we lose in some ways an ability to speak to it. And then she goes on to write, a predominantly white, uneducated, evangelical Christian population animated by discontent, rage, woundedness, or all three brought Donald Trump to power. So those are like those are super important dimensions that are very much worth talking about and 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 worth speaking to in class. But I think ultimately we ha like we have an obligation to help our kids navigate those waters, How, wherever they might land. I think we can't flee the conversation in the name of like civility mm -hmm. or avoiding conflict. We got off topic. We're sort of. We we got we went deep into a rabbit hole. It's important and is like a little preamble for tomorrow, I guess. Kind of. Um, there'll be more yeah, of, true, of that fair. deep conversation <laughs> tomorrow. Um, all of it is to say that that our higher education institutions are definitely not putting their best foot forward when it comes to combating issues of anti-blackness, of racism, of systemic inequities, and of providing critical spaces for critiquing of any of society. Really, like. 
I think the the TLDR is that most higher education institutions are about quiet contemplation. They want to just ride the wave no matter where it goes. No tricks, no th- nothing fancy. Just just letting it be, right? Letting it rock just as long as the money's still coming in. Hey, you're too Don't push anybody's buttons. <laughs>